Hi, everyone, and welcome to Occupational Therapy 212, Occupations Through the Lifespan. My name is Melissa Kay. I'll be your instructor, along with the roosters outside who will not stop crowing this morning. Today's topic is middle childhood, our uh, kids who are between 6 and 12 years of age. Uh, important to note is that the original uh, slide deck for this lecture came from uh, some of my students in 2020, so I owe a debt of gratitude to them for their wonderful work. Uh, Katerina Miller, Shiana Hosseini, Gavin Ellis, Mercedes Mansfield, and Cynthia Martinez. Thanks everyone for starting this off, and I have since revised the lecture. We have three objectives today. We want to first look at theory in middle childhood and see how that happens. Some of our theorists will be familiar and we'll be looking at different stages of development and some will be new. Then we'll also review development across a variety of domains. And finally, we'll look at how disability and other issues affect development and occupational engagement in middle childhood. We're going to start with some theory. We have four theorists who we will be associating with middle childhood, Piaget, Erickson, Habighurst, and Freud. So let's look in a little bit more detail. Our first theorist, uh, Jean Piaget, is uh, probably familiar to you from earlier in childhood, but in middle childhood, and even towards the end of preschool years, we start looking at the third stage of uh, cognition called concrete operations. The concrete operational stage is characterized uh, by a few different things. First, uh, the child is now able to organize their thinking and they engage in rational thinking. So there's not so much magical thinking. Kids are not entirely ruled by their sensory motor systems um, and they're starting to have the prefrontal cortex wake up and, and start engaging in intellectual thought. In other words, this idea of rational and logical thinking. We also uh, see that children in this stage are processing environmental contexts uh, very logically. So they're looking at the world around them and they're figuring out how does this work, not just how does this work um, in relationship to me, but how does it work? Still, um, kids tend to be quite um, self-centered and self-focused, uh, and that's normal. That's not like a simply egotistical thing, but they're processing their environments in a logical manner and figuring out the physics of them. And also uh, this stage is characterized by something called conservation. So what Piaget meant by conservation and what kids in this uh, stage can do is to understand that if a material is manipulated, um, say you have a ball of clay and you flatten it, they understand that it still has the same amount of material or mass, whether it's round or if it's in a different shape. The typical example is a glass of water. So they understand if you have a tall, skinny glass of water and a squat, wide glass of water, that the same amount of water can be in both, even though it looks different. So again, it's the beginning of this sort of rational and logical thinking about the world that involves um, natural laws. So that's Piaget. And Erickson, who we've also visited with throughout the lifespan, and we will continue to visit with, um, terms this stage of development industry versus inferiority. So children in this age either decide that um, that they can be engaged in doing and not engaged in industry like working in a factory, but engaged with occupation and activity in a meaningful and helpful way, or they suffer 
from uh, from feeling inferior to their peers. And so there's a lot of peer comparison, and this is the age that that starts. And of course, it continues into adolescence. And for most of us, we're comparing ourselves against our peers throughout our lifespan, right? But this is the earliest stage that it typically starts, sometimes later, uh, later preschool, but definitely it comes to the fore in middle childhood. Um, some really great things also happen. Um, kids are eager to learn and, co- and collaborate with each other. So we no longer have the, this is mine and it's, and it's all mine and you can't have it and I'm not going to share. Kids in this stage, and you'll see this as we look at play, are actually engaged with each other with uh, cooperation and collaboration at times. And they start to derive satisfaction from their accomplishments. Our next theorist is Havokhurst, and um, he talks about uh, this idea of thrusts. So those are various different uh, parts of his theory or stages of his theory. So in middle childhood, Um, It's a time, again, as Erickson says, that you're focused on your peer group. There's a lot of physical development, as we know, and it's not the beginnings of physical development, but it's really a lot about the refinement of of physical development. Um, For example, kids will start to play organized sports at this age. They'll also engage in much more high-level physical pursuits, right? And that's possible because they have the coordination they have the strength, they have the, uh, the sensory foundation to build on motor competence. And so they're really coming into their own physically. And then they also um, are maturing mentally into conceptual thinking. So uh, again, this idea of logic, symbols, which if you think about it, letters are symbols that combine into words, which are symbols for things that exist in reality, right? So reading happens at this age, Um, logical connections and not so much magical thinking. So you're probably getting a trend here between the theorists and also a higher level of communication. So uh, individuals of this age are typically well-versed in both receptive and expressive communication, and they're relying on uh, communication to get their needs met. Um, So yeah, that's Havikhurst. And then Freud is uh, our final uh, theorist, and this stage um, is termed the latency stage. So you know that he's got kind of a psychosexual take on everything as well as the id, the ego and the super ego, right? So in middle childhood, he calls this the latency period because prior to puberty, and, and note that as we move into the 21st century, we're actually seeing kids, especially girls, enter puberty earlier and earlier. So they may leave this latency period before they leave middle childhood, okay? So just be aware of that. But in this prepubescent state, there's what Freud termed a repression of sexuality. Mostly, um, we don't have the early, early childhood exploration of the body and how it works so much. And we also don't have puberty and hormones driving the individual to um, to think about and engage in sexual behavior. So it's sort of a even keel kind of um, laid back period, if you will, a dormancy or a latency of sexuality, which then culminates with the onset of puberty. So as we go through this slide deck, you'll note that there are certain slides that are just um, labeled uh, with the topic. So when you're studying or if you'd like to go back and look at one of the sections, you can identify it by um, seeing this particular version of the slide with just a few words. 
It's a way to organize the slide deck. I'll also at this point bring to your attention that there is a wealth of information in the presenter notes. And when the slide deck is posted, it will include the presenter notes. So please, please have a look at that. Don't rely on the sound of my voice, um, but actually bring up the slide deck while you're um, watching or studying so that you can get the benefit of the presenter notes. All right, so um, brain development, really crucial for the child in middle childhood and also of great interest to occupational therapists. So we have a few things happening. The first is hemic hemispheric specialization. Um, so if you'll recall, uh, we have two hemispheres of our brain that are joined together by the corpus callosum in the middle. And uh, specialization or the dividing of roles in the brain. Now, you know, people say, oh, I'm left brain, I'm right brain. Um, nobody is uh, solely left brain or right brain unless you've had a hemispherectomy, which is extremely rare. Um, so we're talking about sort of dominance with various tasks. And the left hemisphere um, in middle childhood becomes increasingly involved with language and movement. Um, so uh, Broca's and Wernicke's on the left, right? And the um, right hemisphere is mainly involved with analyzing uh, geometrical shapes and elements. So right side is kind of the, the more of the perceptional piece and left side is more of the, again, logical, rational thinking piece. Uh, the corpus callosum at this point also becomes myelinated. So myelin being the fatty protective cover um, around some of our neurological structures, our neurons and, and other structures. Um, and this happens to the corpus callosum in middle childhood, which when you have this kind of uh, fatty covering, it acts like a sheath. And I kind of think of it like a wire, like a telephone wire or um, a computer wire um, that is covered with a plastic sheath, right? It's covered with a sheath and it enables information to move more quickly because it's protected and it's also isolated. So um, more efficient communication between the two hemispheres starts to be able to happen because of this myelination in middle childhood. And lastly, uh, the frontal lobes of the brain, which I've already mentioned, um, our frontal cortex and prefrontal cortex are growing during this phase of development, which uh, enables the middle childhood individual to have more cognitive flexibility as well as more higher level and intellectual thought. And I don't mean intellectual like um, oh, you're a smarty pants, um, but more like reasoning, logic, rational thinking. We'll also see that in middle childhood, sensory wise, uh, at around eight years of age, the child in, um, in sensory integration theory, right, which is not one of our theories, but I'll bring it up for just a second, starts to be able to inhibit parts of the nervous system that they don't want to attend to. And so that can account for more of the uh, single-minded focus that happens in this age and stage of development. If you have questions about that or it's not particularly clear, we can talk more about it in class. All right, and um, speaking of sensory, there's also um, a great deal of refinement in sensory development, most especially, well, across the board, right? So we're getting a lot in terms of proprioceptive refinement, um, vestibular refinement, which feeds into motor competency, but we're also getting it in terms of visual and auditory. So visual acuity develops to 20-20 vision, so we're seeing very sharply unless the individual has a, a visual deficit and needs corrective lenses. And um, we want to compare this with what was happening just six short years ago with the newborn, which was 20 400 vision. So now we have 2020 versus 2400. Huge difference. Also auditory development. So this improves as the child uh, gains the skills of understanding and processing auditory information. Um, so communication and auditory are closely linked. Um, 
Kids in this stage of development are able to associate a variety of auditory stimuli with their source, so they know where a sound is coming from and they can localize. They utilize auditory information to process language, so it's not just sounds and tones and um, and the flavor of the sound that's coming in, like you know, like with a baby, like the mommy's voice is high and it's sing-songy and and uh, rhythmic, but they're actually processing language. Um, they've also gained the ability to hear, remember, repeat, and recall words. Um, also to phrase and sequence numbers. So a huge amount of skills that are quite necessary for school. And if you think about it, six years old, first grade, we're really moving from preschool and kindergarten age into the more hardcore years of a child's education. Let's look a little bit at physical development, and um, we're going to zero in on two areas. The first is body composition. So there's very dramatic changes during middle childhood. And again, think about it, the six-year-old versus the 12-year-old are kind of two different beasts, right? But um, during this age, children grow approximately two to three inches per year between the ages of six and 11. There's an increase in um, skeletal and muscle mass, and also muscle strength increases quite a bit. The bones and joints um, become more susceptible to injuries. This is because they're actually um, hardening and, and calcifying, and so they're not, as, uh, they're not as flexible or bendy anymore. So it's enabling us to support greater height and greater weight because they're hard, but they're also um, less uh, less able to withstand impact. Uh, children experience refined balance and postural control. So again, the vestibular system is refining at this age. The center of gravity drops, um, and so they find a, a true center of gravity as they get taller. And there's an increase in the ability to calibrate movement. So we're thinking about fine movement, right? Both gross motor and fine motor. So if you take, uh, for example, kicking a soccer ball, it's not just that you get it to go sort of in the right direction, but that a particular part of the foot contacts the ball. Um, the speed, the force, the degree of direction are all getting very refined. And so you can see at this age why, again, organized sports and physical pursuits really are getting um, very much more uh, the center of that child's world. Uh, fine motor skills are also getting more developed and refined. Finger dexterity and bilateral coordination is refined. Um, and the speed and dexterity of movements increase. So if you think about it, you know, our, um, our toddlers and preschoolers are kind of scribbling. Towards the end of our preschool age, kids are starting to be able to draw and write, but it really gets refined when we enter the middle childhood age. And think about um, the primer paper that um, you might remember having um, when you were really young, right? So it's got three lines and one of them's red and there's a dotted line. And then in middle childhood, we move to paper that just has two lines. Sometimes those lines are pretty skinny. So it is evidence of the um, calibration and refinement that's happening. Uh, also, coincidence anticipation timing is refined, and this is the ability to time a movement in response to a moving object. For uh, example, if someone is throwing um, a ball at you and you're playing tag, um, you know, like ball tag, you can dart out of the way. If um, you are... Um, uh, somebody throws a super ball at you, you can move and catch it, right? So the fine motor skill is refining in this coincidence anticipation timing, and you want to keep that, um, that term in mind, um, is also getting refined. By age five, children typically have a consistent hand preference. Now we know that hand dominance may not happen until the age of about 
uh, seven, but by age five, six, a child is using one hand for most hand dominant activities. And what we want to see is not that all hand dominant activities are done with the same hand, but that most are. And one um, example of kind of a, um, a, an alteration to this would be cutting with scissors. So we'll see a kid throw a ball, write, color, button, um, do all sorts of things. I'm left-handed, so I'm demonstrating with my left hand. Um, all those with one hand, but then they might use scissors with their other hand. And that's not a big deal. But for most people, they're developing uh, a hand preference, which then solidifies into a hand dominance. And they do everything uh, that requires that dominance with the preferred hand. And as I said at the beginning of this little section, bilateral coordination is getting refined. And so the helper hand is also becoming a lot more skilled.